This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell, <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world is that right? Currently, there are only two Fortune 500 companies run by African American women. One of those women is Roz Brewer, who is leading Walgreens Boots Alliance, a well-known pharmacy chain. I sat down with Roz Brewer to talk about how she's trying to transform that company into one that also offers additional healthcare services to its customers. I have noticed that Walgreens and a, another company that's also in the drugstore area, I won't mention their name, but a, but a competitor of yours, uh, both of you seem to be interested in being in the healthcare business as opposed to the pharmaceutical drugstore business. Why is that? What's, what's so much better about the healthcare business? So first of all, you know, we've been, Walgreens started in 1901. And, you know, when you think about drug dispensing, it's, um, it's critical to all of us at some point in our lives. But one of the things that's very clear to us um, ending the pandemic or in the middle of a pandemic, we realized our relationship with our customers and our patients was so much more critical. We delivered 70 million shots in arms during the time of the pandemic. But the relationship just went to the next level. Pharmacists have always been consultants with customers and patients, and you will see your pharmacist 10 times more than you see your primary care physician. But the idea of having a primary care physician interacting with the pharmacist is the way of the future. And we will, we will need that ecosystem around us. Okay, so in your case, um, Walgreens case, you have begun a business, you've bought a lot of companies in this area that are primary physician companies. In other words, That's right. you buy uh, the practices of primary physicians and then in effect those doctors are working for Walgreens and they are still serving their patients but they're in effect employees of Walgreens, is that right? That's, that's correct. They're, um, so we are purchasing, we just purchased Summit Health in the New Jersey, New York area and um, now we're one of the largest primary care physician practices in the country. So primary care physician practice, um, what, how many people in the United States of the 300, 30 million people we have or so, how many of them actually have a primary physician? From what we understand, less than 30% of Americans have a primary care physician. Okay. And do you think it's good to get an annual physical every year? I know you're not a doctor, but- you know, No, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but, you know, I will tell you that, you know, we're all gonna be responsible for our health, both financially and managing our own care. And to get a physical every year is a good uh, database for you, a, a baseline to build for yourself because it's gonna fall back on you. You need to know more about your personal health so that you can interact effectively with your primary care physician. So I get an annual physical every year. I try to starve myself for the two weeks before the annual <laughs> Yes, physical. I have mine tomorrow, yes. I, I have found it doesn't work, but okay. Uh, what do you think the biggest healthcare challenge is for Americans? Is it that we're overweight, we take too many drugs? Uh, what, what is the so problem? So I think it's, it's two-pronged. One is that, yes, obesity is a big problem, um, but I think it's, it's negligence, but it's not intentional. I think people are confused about the cost and access of healthcare, and they think it's going to cost them a lot. Um, and when people have variable employment, as we've seen across these last several years, is that you know they're not quite sure what their insurance will cover and, and not cover and what their out-of-pocket expense will be. So they avoid going to the doctor. And I think that is something we've got to bring clarity to, which is why you know, the digital side of healthcare is going to become very important so that we can all look at our mobile devices and understand what's going on with their bodies. COVID brought a lot of people into the drugstores to get their COVID shots, I guess. Has a business picked up or gone down since COVID has more or less waned a bit in terms of people getting shots? You know, what we're seeing at Walgreens is that we created, you know, an expanded relationship. Um, it did start with immunizations, but now people are very deliberate about their flu shots. And so they're still getting COVID shots uh, today, vaccines today, and they're getting flu shots in combination. Um, our retail business, if you look at our prior earnings is, is up uh, and performing well, um, especially as we transition into healthcare, the front of our stores are, are picking up. So I have read that post COVID, it's difficult for um, companies like yours to get entry level people to come in. They're 
they either don't want to come back into the workforce or they don't want the job that you can provide them. Is it hard for you to get people? I notice in the stores that I go to, the drug stores, they're always fresh people all the time, new yes, people. Yes, you know, there's a lot of turnover at the hourly level, I, I, I will admit. Um, but as we have these conversations, it's becoming less about pay and more about their lifestyle and what they want to do and progression. And so what we're encouraging is that, you know, work at, at a Walgreens store and you can become a shift manager and escalate. And that's really what they want to think about as a, a career and development. So if you were an entry level person at one of these stores like Walgreens, uh, what kind of compensation do you get? Is the more above the minimum wage, but you pay like $15 an hour or something like exactly, that? Exactly, exactly. And then it moves up based on, you know, shift manager and other responsibilities in the, in the building. So I've noticed that uh, in the, a lot of the stores I go into, there used to be younger people post-college or something who were the younger people working, servicing the uh, drug, drug store. Now I see a lot of people who are older, like post-retirement kind of people doing it. Is that um, a phenomenon you You know, we, we see both. Um, you know, on the younger end of the spectrum, it's those looking for development or fill-in job while they're in college and doing something otherwise in their lives. And then the retirement community is a very, um, you know, rich environment for us to recruit from. So I notice in a couple of drugstores, even in my area, which is not the poorest area in Washington, D.C., it's a nice upscale sort of area. Um, <laughs> when I want to get razor blades, you have to go to the front of the place and ask somebody to unlock it. Why, why are you locking up razor blades and other things that I might want to buy? Yes. <laughs> So, you know, this is a national problem and, you know, this isn't, you know, uh, random theft. This is organized crime. And, you know, state legislation has put guidelines on, you know, how much you, you know, the theft it, that uh, you, you can steal before you're convicted. So it's a thousand dollar limit. But we have been partnering with other retailers and sharing our camera feed. I know um, some of our partners here from Walmart are here, but we are all part of an organization that's coming together that says if you've, you know, we can put our camera feed together and tell that that person has been in our store and their store and the numbers are higher than 1,000. So we've been able to impact these uh, theft rings um, most recently. What are the things that are unlocking key the most? What are people trying to steal the most uh, <laughs> other than razor blades? I guess. You know, I will tell you, um, I actually it started at razor blades because that's such a high ticket item, but um, you know, it's a lot of uh, cosmetics, but really what happens is that um, they take advantage of what I would call the elbow move and they just come in and swipe a counter. And so it's just a matter of categories now almost and not just particular. So what is the most profitable high margin thing that you all sell? I'd have to say it's in our cosmetics area is, um, is one. And then in some of our durable medical goods, some of our um, take home testing and things like that are are very nice margin items. What is the most, common, most frequent thing that you sell? Most frequent thing is probably um, toiletries like toothpaste and personal care items okay. of those those types. And of why is it that whenever there is like a scare coming along or a pandemic or something, people rush to buy toilet paper? Um, <laughs> you notice that people are just they're, they're stockpiling toilet paper. It's is called that a hoarding, hoarding, and okay. it's one of those things you never want to be without. Okay. So. <laughs> What's the biggest surprise of being the CEO of Walgreens? It's how complex healthcare is and how um, unfortunate it is to try and manage, you know, personal health in the health systems that we've set up in this country. You're from Detroit. Uh, you're family. How many siblings do you have? If I, I have three sisters and a brother. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's you're the youngest? Us. I'm the youngest of five. Okay. And are any of the others running drugstore chains? <laughs> no, but I do have a sister that's a pharmacist. Wow. Is yes. she at Walgreens or? No, she's not. No, oh. we don't want to mix. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So you're, you're, what did your parents do? So both my parents are, are, are deceased, but my parents worked in the auto industry. And so my dad um, eventually worked as a member of management and my mom worked in um, hourly labor at uh, okay. So at you, General Motors. you can go to many good colleges. You went to Spelman, an excellent college in Atlanta. Yes. Why did yes. you choose Spelman? Well, I chose Spelman because, you know, I grew up in Michigan. I wanted to do something a little different, um, get out of the cold weather, but it was also a chance for me to be at an institution that I thought 
really reflected me, who I was, and what I wanted to do. And I think also, too, I mean, I, I got a scholarship, and so that was helpful being, at the time, there were four of us in college. And so um, I was actually pursuing, you know, support at that time, too. And what did you major, and what did you want to be? I majored in chemistry, and I thought, you know, I had always been pretty decent in the math and sciences, so I just did what I knew what to do. And I thought I'd either go into medicine or engineering. Um, and actually, I was recruited away by Kimberly Clark to work in long-range research as a chemist. So I, I moved so you, in that you direction. You thought you might go to medical school, but Kimberly Clark stole you away. Right. OK, right. so what did you do for 22 years at Kimberly Clark? So I started off in long-range research as a, as a chemist. I was an organic chemist. Um, and I had interned um, my summers at General Motors. And so I worked in chemistry there. I worked in analytical chemistry. I moved into organic, worked in polymer science. And then I worked in, um, on one of the businesses. I got a chance to join the M&A team probably about six years into my career. And um, at the time, it was when Kimberly Clark was converting itself from a paper company to consumer products company. And we acquired several companies, and I got to run one of those companies, and I just stayed on the business side after that. Okay, so you're doing that. You're there 22 years. You're happy, presumably. Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden, somebody calls you up and says, how about working for Walmart? What did you say? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> on the first call, I said no. Um, Probably the first, second, and third call, I said no. Um, you know, if initially they were speaking to me about a job in human resources, and I really don't have that skill set. And so, um, once an opportunity came um, came about that had a P and L to it, I, I joined the company, and I I was group president at Kimberly Clark, and I took a VP regional job to run the state of Georgia. Okay. So you're at Walmart, and then somebody calls up and says, how would you like to run Sam's Club? Is that right? Yes. Well, a lot happened in the first five years where <laughs> um, I ran Georgia, the southeast, then the east coast of uh, Walmart stores. And then um, I was a candidate for the Sam's Club job. All right. So you're minding your business. You're running Sam's Club eventually, right? Right. You did it for five years? Yes, I did. Okay. So you're there for five years. You're the CEO. It's a pretty good job, I guess. Where, you work, where, where were you living to do that? I was in Bentonville. Arkansas. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're in Bentonville, and all of a sudden, I guess another headhunter called you up and said, how would you like to go to Starbucks? Is that right? <laughs> no, actually, I made the decision to leave uh, Walmart stores, and um, I was on the board of Starbucks. And I had taken the, um, the board seat as I was leaving Sam's Club, and so I had a conversation, attending a board meeting, and uh, Howard Schultz and Kevin Johnson approached me to become the chief operating officer. But you said you don't really drink coffee, or you didn't say that? <laughs> you know, I, I was a tea drinker at the time, so that was interesting. Um, <laughs> and Seattle wasn't in my um, plans. But um, I did, I, I fell in love with the brand and the company. Um, I saw a great opportunity for, um, to help the company operate a little stronger. Okay, so you moved from Bentonville to Seattle, and you yes. became the chief operating officer of Starbucks. And Starbucks has become so successful because its coffee is better than other people's coffee? Or what is the reason you think it's so successful? I think it's two things. I think it is um, definitely quality coffee. It's uh, customized, right, for all drinking palates. Um, I also think that it's their coffee practices along with the baristas in the store. I think the baristas are top notch and really interact great with the customer. What's the most popular thing that people ask for when they go to Starbucks? Is it Oh gosh, they, you know, really just a simple pike, um, is, which is a, a black coffee, um, is still very popular at Starbucks. Okay. The cold beverages are really, you know, trending, so. Okay, so you're there, you're doing that for four years. Yes. And all of a sudden, I assume a headhunter calls you again? Yeah, now that was a headhunter. All right, a headhunter calls you up <laughs> and says, uh, how would you like to run Walgreens? And you say... I'm happy at Starbucks or what? I, I say, I think about it for a minute because um, I, I really, I was enjoying Starbucks. Um, I, you know, wanted to be there and um, didn't really think of myself, you know, coming back into that level of retail. But it was the pandemic and there were so many people dying at that point and people who were adverse to uh, being vaccinated, and I knew for sure, because I follow the science on things, you know, my background is in chemistry, and the science just screamed, you know, that if a vaccine became available, 
we could curtail this. But death Starbucks, story. you have the perfect name for that brewer, right? So yes. did they ever mention that to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got that all the time. Okay. Um, you know, everything was what's brewing and all these, uh, yes, hashtag everything. So yes. th what did you, when you told Howard Schultz you're leaving to go to another company, what did he say? <laughs> Actually, I had that conversation with Kevin first. Um, it wasn't it wasn't pleasant. Um, I, I, I think the, the board was a little surprised, you know, but we made it work. So do you ever go to Starbucks now? Every day. Oh, every day, yes. okay. Yes. You ever go to Sam's Club every day still? Yes, not every day. I, buy, I bulk right. up and... Loyal. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so now what's the biggest surprise of being the CEO of Walgreens? You know, I think the biggest surprise to me was how complex healthcare is and how um, unfortunate it is to try and manage, you know, personal health in the health systems that we've set up in this country. And um, it's, it's, it's perplexing. I think that this marketplace is ripe for disruption and I'm sort of drawn to um, transformation and disruption. So. I was, became super excited about it once I began to peel back the understanding of the business. Right. So you're the CEO of a healthcare company, in effect. It does, yes. Um, you, you have the physician's business, and you also have the uh, pharmaceutical business. What do you do to stay healthy? Because you have to be a role model, right? You can't yeah. look yeah. like you're not healthy, right? So how, do you have to exercise yeah. a lot or what? Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, like I said, my, my, my health exam is tomorrow morning. I'll be heading back to Chicago to, to get that done. So I, I take care of myself in that way. I like supplements, so you know I'm, I, I take my vitamins um, daily, and then I will tell you that I work out three or four times a week as best I can, and so I I, I, I make it a priority for well, sure. I think about working out three or four times a week, yes. but I actually don't yeah. do it. The thing I haven't solved though is sleep, and I think that's our biggest opportunity. If I get sleep down, maybe I can lay off of the supplements a little well, bit. Well, um, you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep a night. No way. No, you don't get eight no hours. No way. So let me ask you what it feels like uh, to be in your situation. Is it more disappointing or surprising that of all the uh, CEOs in the Fortune 500, there are only two female African-American CEOs? Only two. Right. You and the CEO of, uh, of, of um, Teachers is the only other one, I think. Yes, TIA. And so mm -hmm. are you surprised that at this late date in our history we only have two or yeah. disappointed? Well, um, I'm more disappointed than I am surprised. Um, I'm not surprised because I know what it took for me to get here, and I know the trials and tribulations that I've been through. And, um, you know, I'm not quite sure uh, a lot of people would want to withstand that. But I would tell you that the disappointing part is that um, this is just is, is totally ridiculous that there's only two of us. Um, I think, you know, it's going to go beyond mentoring and sponsoring. It's, it's um, pipeline, you know, filling the pipeline effectively, getting um, people of um, different races in operating roles, um, and having the confidence that, you know, that they can do it because they absolutely can. So in your career, what has been a bigger problem, being a female or being African American or neither? You know, I would have to say being African-American. Um, I think that um, it is still, you know, a, an issue in our environment to accept people of different races more so than it is gender. Um, I've, I think I've seen a lot of progress with women in, in corporate America, and I'd like to see more progress with people of color. So as we talk today, you're in Washington, D.C. Yes. I presume you're here to meet with government officials to some yes. extent. Uh, do you find that an uplift, uplifting experience when you do that? <laughs> You know, I find I, I find um, quite a few teachable moments for both of us. You know, I try and bring the real life experience of healthcare to legislation, so that when the right um, decisions are in front of them, they make great decisions. So, what is the principal thing that the let's say the drugstore industry would like to have the Congress do? 
You know, first and foremost, you know, I would love to see our pharmacists to operate at the top of their license. And so for them to pass legislation that will allow pharmacists to both test and treat so that there's not a second step in, you know, just imagine a mom who has to take a child out of school and take them to pick up a prescription only to find out that the child is still sick and go back to the doctor. So if it's an ear infection, strep throat, we can do a test in the store to figure out and then pass on the prescription and, and the recovery period is smoother. You and need everyone legislation goes for that? We absolutely do, yes. Okay, and do you meet people from the administration as well or? I do, you know, most recently um, there's members of Senate that um, are primary care physicians and so I, I know who they are so I meet with them regularly because they understand us best and help us carry the, me the message, you know, throughout. So your competitor, principal one is CBS, I think probably their largest competitor, some people would say. Um, if I, if, I, if CVS is right here and Walgreens is right there and I could go to either one, why should I go to Walgreens over CVS? I could pick either one. What, what, why are you better than CVS? So glad you asked me that question. The, um, you know, I believe our customer experience model is um, stronger. I think that um, when you walk into a Walgreens store, you may not have this happen to you every time, but I think you get a nice greeting from our cashiers, and I think our pharmacists are second to none. If you walk into a Walgreens today, would they know you? It depends. If I worked out that morning, no, because they don't <laughs> recognize me. But um, sometimes no, sometimes yes. Um, and sometimes I can hear them say that I'm in the store. You know, I can hear oh. them chattering. So when they say, yes. so you walk into a store, though, and if you don't like something, you call the manager and say, this isn't good, or do you just kind of tell them when you get back to the office. So really what I do is I take a picture of it and I send it back to my team at the office and say, I wonder why this is happening, right? Because usually it's a decision we've made that is causing something to happen. Nine times out of 10, it's something we've done versus what the store has done. So if you need a prescription, do you have to wait in line? Or I do, I have to wait in line. You wait in line? I do. You ever say, I'm the CEO of this company, I'm waiting in line? No. Absolutely not, no, but usually there's not um, too much of a line, so, but I, and, and I know the, the best hours to show up, too. You're obviously, you've had an incredible career. Your parents, did your parents live to see your success? You know, it's interesting. Um, if I could describe my dad, my dad would define my success as what I did in my, you know, throughout my education. My dad was that father that showed up to everything. If I was getting the yellow ribbon and not the gold ribbon, he was still there rooting me on. So he really knew who I was as an individual. You know, he, uh, we talked about that a lot. Uh, he passed away six weeks before I finished Spelman. And um, he, he, we had conversations. Um, he saw something in me and he let me know that. So I think he is looking down. I think he kind of knew something good was going to happen. My mom definitely lived through a good part of this. Um, and then my siblings are sharing in, you know, the the excitement in our family. But your siblings, you were the youngest. Your siblings uh, say, well, when we were beating you up, we didn't really mean it. Oh, yeah. The like days that. my brother would, yeah, right, right. The days my brother would throw me across the room, yes. Same. But we're very close now. Right. <laughs> and they have to wait in line for prescription. <laughs> they, 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 they can. So sometimes headhunters have called you and said, would you be interested in this job or that? If a headhunter called you now for another corporate job, you're... No, I, I would not. I, I, I really, truly think this is the culmination of everything I've done in my life is, is coming to bear right now. This is what I want to do. Um, I'm being, we're being very intentional about impacting medically underserved communities. That's important to me.